Hola a todos. Bienvenidos a En Casa con la Plaza. This is La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, our series of programs of conversations, presentations, demonstrations, and performances from our home to yours. Three, sometimes more times per week, and this is one of those weeks. It's our way of fulfilling our mission of telling the little known stories of Mexican, Mexican Americans, all Latinos, and the founding growth and evolution of the greater Los Angeles region. Once a month, we host the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation for the Mexican American History Maker session. And for this session, I'm going to bring up my good friend, our good friend, Bell Hernandez, to take us through our program. Take it away, Bell. Thank you, Abelardo. Thank you, uh, La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. We so enjoy partnering with you for our History Maker event. We are so excited to have with us two fabulous women who are gonna speak and you're gonna get to know Marisa Lopez and our history maker, Nancy de los Santos. But first, uh, let me just, um, I wanted to tell everyone that we are an organization that represents Mexican Americans and we focus on Mexican Americans because we are the ones that are the uh, always um, being in uh, the president's words, uh, we're a rapist and all the horrible things he said. So this is about Mexican Americans because 66% of the US Latinos are Mexican or of Mexican origin. And this year marks a momentous occasion. And I just wanna uh, let you all know that on August 29th in 1970, the Chicano Mor Moratorium happened and we are celebrating um, that this weekend on Saturday, a lot of groups. But what is the Chicano Moratorium? Well, it was formerly known as the National Chicano Moratorium Committee Against the Vietnam War. It was a movement of Chicano anti-war activists that built a broad-based coalition of Mexican-American groups to organize in the opposition of the Vietnam War. It was led by activists from local colleges and members of the Brown Berets, a group with roots in the high school student movement. They staged, who staged walkouts in 1968. So the coalition peaked with August 29th, 19, in 1970, March, which drew over 30,000 demonstrators, peaceful demonstrators. And the march was described by scholars Lorenza Oropesa as one of the largest assemblages of Mexican Americans ever. So the event was reportedly watched by the Los Angeles FBI office who later refused to release the entire content because what was a peaceful demonstration turned out to be uh, police beating up on women, families, men, children, and it ultimately resulted in the death of a Los Angeles Times um, journalist who spoke out a lot about Chicanos. His name was Ruben Salazar. And so this year marks the 50th anniversary. It is a long, very interesting story. And we, we wanna honor um, Ruben Salazar as well, but that will be in our next month's um, History Maker event. I just wanted to let you know that there's celebrations going on this Saturday. So please look on Facebook just uh, or Google Chicano Moratorium. There's a lot of events that are com commemorate, com commemorating this. And I was one, I was at the Chicano Moratorium. So this is really, really uh, a momentous occasion for uh, all of us. But let's move on now to what we're here for, okay? We are here for the History Maker. We are here to learn about this organiz organization and what it does. And I would love to introduce to you the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation President, Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz, who is gonna tell us all about what we do at this organization. So Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz, take it away. Thank you, Bell. Thank you, Bell. Well, yeah, such powerful, powerful uh, efforts there our ancestors have been doing, you know, very recently and of course for 200 years, you know, um, the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation's mission is to change the distorted false offensive narrative that, that exists about Mexican Americans in this country. And we know what it is, my friends. We all, we're all tired of, of, the, of the stereotypical things that we hear in, in, and often people tell me, why do you have to remind us of those things? Why do you have to bring the, 
the, the, the story of, uh, let's go get some Mexicans at the Home Depot. And you know what? History repeats itself, my friends. And we, we need to remember that. And we need to remember all the, all the things that our ancestors had had to do, like the Chicano movement, the, the fight for our, for, for our opportunities. And, and often people tell me, well, why do you have to have an organization about Mexicans and not just Latinos? Because, because Mexican Americans for 200 years have been intentionally, you know, mis uh, 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 offended and, and distorted. Uh, you know, the opinion of what Mexicans is is so false, so far from the truth. Because we need to remember, our friends, that that that, that our ancestors had were were the center of culture of this continent. We need to remember that, that, that uh, uh, after the Spaniards arrived, then those amazing cultures merged together in the greatest e empire in the continent that, that you know, was, was built, the, the, the empire that went as far as the Philippines, you know, it was center in Mexico City. And, uh, and you know, our ancestors invented the cowboys. We need to we need to talk with pride about our, our illustrious, uh, uh, you know, uh, community. And one of the most important things that we always want to remember is what really makes Mexican Americans special is is our our um, our beautiful people, mm -hmm. and 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 because we're hard workers, and and that's exactly what we want to remember here. We want to remind our friends about all these great people that have done so many good things for this country and we want to and and and, and that's why we have developed this this event called the mexican american history makers and we bring people that we're so proud of you know professor marisa lopez you know we're so proud of her you know all the amazing things that she's doing to educate our community about about the history of of, of mexicans in this state in this city which you know which is very illustrious and and of course uh, our history maker nancy so so it's going to be an amazing event let's let's remember you know who we really are friends we, we can't forget and you know we can't forget what our ancestors have had to put up with and and we are you know we are sometimes people say oh we're doing really good no we're not my friends we're not because uh it is disappointing to see that the the you know you see the, the political conventions, and I don't see any Mexican Americans in them. You know, Mexican Americans is 12% of the population. African Americans are 14% of the population. Where are the Mexican Americans? So we're, 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 we need to do a lot more. And that's why we have this amazing people. They have done so much. So with, any, with, with that, you know, too much more conversation from my side. I want to pass it now to back to Bell Hernandez, who we're so proud of, who's going to introduce, you know, Marisa, and I can't wait to listen to Marisa. Bell, we can't hear you. Uh, maybe your, your mic? The mic? There we go. Thank maybe. you. So sorry about that. Okay, so I am so thrilled to present Dr. Professor Marisa Lopez, who is an associate professor of English and Chicano Studies at UCLA. Professor Lopez is the current vice president of the Latino Latina Studies Association, an academic organization that brings together scholars, students, activists, and community leaders in Latinx studies. She's also served as an associate director of the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center, UCLA's Committee on Diversity and Equal Opportunity, and the Modern Language Association's Executive Committee on Chicano, Chicana Literature. She is currently at work on racial immanence, a monograph about uses of the body and effect in Chicano cultural production. Marisa Lopez, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And your introduction, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's making me realize I have to change my faculty page at the English department because racial imminence actually came out. It's a real book now. I'm no longer working on it. I'm done. So you can buy it on Amazon. But 
but thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I am really excited to be here. I'm honored to be sharing this program with Nancy and to be here talking about making history because history is totally my jam, as I will explain to you right now. So I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, Picturing Mexican America, which is a cluster of digital projects that I designed and that I manage. So by way of introduction, though, to that project, I am going to tell you a story about Los Angeles' first hotel. So for the story, we're going to go back in time. That's my back in time sound. Uh, back before the moratorium, we're going back to the 19th century. And I'm going to uh, start sharing my slides now. Uh, I'll share my screen so you can see my slides, because I have lots of pictures to share with you. So present. All right. All right, so this is what I wanted you to be looking at during that introduction. And now I'm gonna tell you about Los Angeles' first hotel, the Bella Union. It began life in 1835 as a store, which became in 1846, Pio Pico, we saw him on the first slide, we'll see him again, Pio Pico's office when he was the last Mexican governor of California before it became part of the United States. It became part of the United States and uh, California became Mex uh, US territory in 1848. Uh, and the building, after being a store, after being Pico's office, it became headquarters for U.S. forces in Los Angeles during the Mexican-American War, which took place from 1846 to 1848. And then eventually, in 1849, the building opened as the Bell Union, uh, which was the best and only hotel in Los Angeles where people went to have a good old-fashioned Wild West time. So remembering the Bell Union, Horace Bell, and that's who, that's who you see in that picture there, Horace Bell wrote of his 1852 arrival in Los Angeles, and I'm gonna quote Bell here. The house was a one-story flat roof adobe. So he's obviously talking about not this version of the Bell Union, but an earlier version, um, with a corral in the rear extending to Los Angeles Street with the usual great Spanish portal near which stood a little frame house, one room above and one room below. The lower room had the sign Imprenta over the door fronting Los Angeles Street, which meant that the star was published therein. The room upstairs was used as a dormitory for the printers and the editors. So Bell goes on to talk about how the rooms were tiny and they had dirt floors and those dirt floors got really muddy when it rained because the roof leaked. So it sounds great, right? Uh, but the hotel bar apparently more than made up for all of that. So if this uh, picture that you're looking at here, uh, this is a drawing from the 1850s. It's not of the Bell Union, but it's depicting a scene that could have been taken from the Bell Union, uh, a kind of multiracial rainbow coalition of gamblers, uh, which one saw a lot of in Los Angeles. So it evokes the kind of diversity that we're about to hear Bell describe. So here's Bell again talking about the Bell Union. The bar was well supplied, so said the advertisement. It was well patronized, so says this truthful historian. In one corner behind the bar stood a double-barreled shotgun, while lying within convenient reach could be seen a couple of colts of the old army pattern carrying half-ounce balls and commonly called batteries. The bar was evidently not to be taken by surprise. The bar was well patronized, so reiterates this pious chronicler, and the patrons who came and went from the Belly Union Bar during that time were the most bandit, cutthroat set that this writer had ever set his youthful eyes upon. Some were dressed in the gorgeous attire of the country. Some half ranchero, half minor. Others were dressed in the most modern style. All, however, had slung to their rear the never failing pair of colts, generally with the accompaniment of the Bowie knife. So out of all this chaos came the Star, which was Los Angeles's first paper of record. And it ran from 1851 to 1879. And in 1855, a yearly subscription to the Star would cost you $5, which you could pay in cash, corn, wheat, flour, wood, butter, or eggs. The Star had a Spanish language section called La Estrella, and that's what you're looking at here. And one of its first editors was a man named Francisco Ramirez, and he was hired in 1851 as a compositor. So he like set the type for the paper. 
And he was only 14 when he was hired. He rose very quickly to become editor of La Estrella in 1854 when he was 17. And then he left just a year after that when he was 18 in 1855 to found his own Spanish language newspaper, which was called El Clamor Público. And that was the first fully Spanish language paper in Los Angeles. So the history and the architecture of this hotel was puro mexicano. And it was a really important place uh, where some of the first Mexican American writing was produced, where Mexican Californian leaders like Pico, who you're looking at here on the slide, hashed out strategies for combating Anglo US aggression, and where all kinds of people came to socialize. So, what happened to the Bell Union? Now, it's Fletcher Bowen Square, which some of you might know very well if you're uh, Los Angeles residences. And it's across the street from the Spring Street Courthouse. So the building might be gone, but some of its history is preserved in two plaques marking two different historical landmarks. So the first uh, announces the spot as California Registered Historical Landmark, uh, number 656, the site of the Bell Union. So that's the picture you're looking at on the left. Uh, and the plaque tells us that the first Overland Mail coach arrived at the Bell Union in 1858. There's no mention of Pico, Spanish architecture, or Mexican society. No mention of the imprenta either, uh, but that's because right next to this plaque, literally right next to it, you'll see the next plaque, which is pictured on the right, uh, and that's the one for landmark 789, which commemorates the star, but not La Estrella, uh, definitely not El Clamor Público or Francisco Ramirez. So these two plaques and the story of the Bell Union are perfect examples of something that's entirely unsurprising, that commemorating history in California, especially in Los Angeles, has largely meant celebrating Anglo-Americans and deliberately ignoring, even erasing Mexican-Americans. The story of early California that we still tell, that our kids are still learning in school, is basically this. So once upon a time, uh, indigenous people lived here, then the Spanish arrived, and that was pretty all right, but awkward sometimes. Uh, and the priests at the missions weren't always so nice, but they meant well. Uh, and then some history happens. Maybe Mexico gained its independence from Spain or something, but we don't really know. We don't care. Uh, things were kind of messed up for a while, but finally, white people showed up and made everything better. So there's a lot that we could dig into here, so much that we could dig into here. Uh, but the thing that's always bothered me is how everyone just glosses over the Mexican period, uh, like it never happened, right? We've got the indigenous, the Spanish, the Yankee settlers, but California used to be Mexico, right? It had Mexican leaders, Mexican dramas, Mexican laws, and every important white guy in California history was able to become important because he married a Mexican woman and got in good with a prominent Mexican family. So the systemic and systematic erasure of those stories is a function of white cultural supremacy and it contributes to the overall impact of institutional racism. So I'm not an expert on public health, uh, poverty or immigration, but I know about stories, that's, that's what I do. Uh, I know about stories and their potential to impact people's lives in meaningful ways. So my belief in the power of story is, and my commitment to telling the long story of Mexican Los Angeles is what drives picturing Mexican America. So the big thing that I'm working towards with picturing Mexican America is an app. And I've had a design team working on this and this is kind of what it will look like. Uh, so we have a little bit of the front end built and we're working on the back end. So this is the, the big project is making this app that is gonna use geodata to display images of 19th century Mexican Los Angeles to users. So for all of last year, I was on sabbatical from UCLA and I was in residence at the central branch of the Los Angeles Public Library. And they've been my primary partners on this project so far. And all the archival material that I've been working with um, has come largely from their collection. So we're hoping to have a beta version of this app available by the end of September. Uh, along the way though, uh, on this app, my project uh, has spawned lots of branches so that where I used to just say, oh, I'm building an app. Now I talk about picturing Mexican America as a cluster of digital projects. So you can find us on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, but we're most active on Instagram. And this is a sample post that we're looking at. 
Um, so we're most active, sorry, on, on Instagram. And you should definitely follow us there to keep up uh, with us and see some of the very cool archival material, like the pictures of the Bell Union uh, that will one day soon be in our app. So our mission on Instagram is to circulate archival material, to free it from wherever it's being ignored, uh, to get as many eyes on it as we can in order to start conversations. So with our posts, we're trying to connect visions of the past to things that are happening today. And we're doing this because our long game, my long game, and the people that I have working with me is to change how people perceive the space of Los Angeles to intervene in how people think about who has the right to be in this territory that we now know as the United States, but which used to be Mexico. And before that, Tovangar. So we're trying to change the conversation about belonging and to make new stories possible. So for example, this is uh, a post that we did back in May. Uh, and I'm just gonna read the text for you because um, it, it goes beyond what uh, you can see on the screen. So here's what this is. It's easy to forget that there's a presidential campaign going on right now, even though we're all aware that the approaching contest will be a momentous one. But did you know that in 1872, Los Angeles experienced a mayoral contest that was arguably even more consequential? Join us at 12.30 p.m. on Friday, May 29th to learn more as we talk with historian David Torres Roof about that contest, which he discusses in his book, Before LA. Uh, in that book, David talks about James Toberman's defeat of incumbent Cristobal Aguilar, and that's who's pictured here, uh, to become, in 1872, LA's 12th mayor. Toberman's victory marked the end of shared politics in LA and ushered in what David describes as an exclusivist racial vision that effectively erased Mexican Americans from the city's political and historical landscape. It also cut Mexican Americans off from emerging civic infrastructure in ways that brought to life LA's current divisions of race and class. In other words, we can trace our understanding of race, space, and class in Los Angeles all the way back to the 1872 mayoral election. We'll talk about all of that and more on Friday. So says the post. You can find that conversation archived uh, on our YouTube channel. You can just search for us on YouTube and, and watch that conversation. So another post from May featured uh, an image that you already saw of the Rainbow Coalition of Early Los Angeles Gamblers. Uh, but we added uh, to that images uh, and connected it to COVID-inspired instances of anti-Chinese sentiment. So I'll just read the text here. Anti-Chinese violence has a long history in the US and was particularly bad in 19th century Los Angeles. Now more than ever, when our Asian friends are afraid to leave the house for fear of getting yelled at, spat on, or worse, we would do well to remember where that kind of nonsense might get us. As it is today, 19th century LA was incredibly cosmopolitan. The drawing above, made in 1850 by an anonymous artist from UC Berkeley's Bankrupt Library, uh, features a gambler uh, dealing to Chinese, Mexican, and Spanish players from different classes. Mexican and Chinese immigrants lived, worked, and played together. They also were subject to racialized violence, but the Chinese really did have it worse, and we don't want to romanticize their cross-racial solidarity. Sure, 19th century, late 19th century LA was an increasingly dangerous place for Mexicans, but nothing ever happened to them that was as bad as what happened to LA's Chinatown in 1871. That October, a mob of Angelinos descended on Chinatown with guns, knives, and ropes. They hauled residents out and hung them from improvised gallows. The mob looted homes and businesses and lynched 19 Chinese immigrants. The photograph above from uh, LA Public Library shows victims' bodies piled near the LA jailhouse. A plaque at 419 North Los Angeles Street commemorates the event in downtown LA. It says, Quote, some policemen and citizens tried to help, but memoirist Horace Bell, we heard from him earlier, uh, disputes that kind of revisionism. And I'm quoting from Bell now. The police force of the city furnished the leaders of the mob, he writes. Quote, the chief of police of Los Angeles stationed his policemen and the deputies he had mustered in for the occasion at all strategic points with orders to shoot to death any Chinese that might stick a head out or attempt to escape from the besieged buildings. End quote. This wasn't the first or last act of Chinese violence, anti-Chinese violence in the city, but it was definitely one of the worst. In these dark times, let's remember that history and make sure it doesn't happen again. So our focus is on Mexican Los Angeles uh, for all the reasons that Bell very um, eloquently articulated in her introduction. Uh, 
but we're also invested in illuminating how diverse Los Angeles always has been and emphasizing how important cross-racial solidarity and collaboration is and, and has always been in our various struggles for social justice. So to that end, I just want to return for a minute to Tavangar, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So at Picturing Mexican America, we recognize the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional caretakers of Tovangar, and that's the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. But we're also grappling with the fact that this space once was, it still is, and it will always be Mexican. And we're finding ways to help people understand that and, and experience Los Angeles' past, present, and future. And we're trying to do that in fun, meaningful, and hopefully transformative ways. So one potentially transformative project of ours that you can explore on your own, even without Instagram, is this. We have teamed up with the Los Angeles Explorers Club to produce a series of self-guided bike tours, and the first of which is called Daily Life in Early Los Angeles. So Los Angeles in the mid-19th century was, as uh, John McFargar describes it in his book Eternity Street, he calls it, quote, a violent place in a violent time. But still, people manage to have a lot of fun here. So what did early Angelinos do uh, to entertain themselves and what do entertainment, popular culture, and daily life in the 19th century tell us about uh, the racial and ethnic tensions of Los Angeles today in 2020? So the ride, the one ride that we have so far, um, you know, explores that question and uncovers some hidden uh, downtown LA landmarks. If you don't have a bike, no problem. Uh, a lot of this ride can be walked and you can follow all of it on Google Maps using Street View. So you can download a PDF of the route on the um, link on the slide. You can also just Google uh, Daily Life in Early Los Angeles bike tour and it's gonna be the first thing that comes up. And you can find the audio for it um, by searching for Picturing Mexican America on SoundCloud or Spotify. And we're about to release our second ride, which is about Arcadia Bandini, and that's gonna focus on the West Side and Santa Monica. You can follow us on Instagram uh, or sign up on our website uh, to receive project updates. That's picturingmexicanamerica.com. So by way of closing, uh, I wanna share just one of the stories from our daily life in early Los Angeles ride that's super interesting, but also speaks to current tensions in LA and to the country as a whole. Uh, and it's about horses. So Andres Pico, brother of Pio Pico, uh, who you saw earlier, Andres and Jose Sepulveda were two um, elite Mexican Californians. They moved in the same social circles, although they weren't especially fond of each other. So these frenemies really loved to race their horses. But unfortunately for Sepulveda, Pico's horses always won. Pico's stallion in particular, Sarco, always came out on top. But Sepulveda really, really needed a win. So here he is on the horse that finally got him that win. So at the end of 1851, he imported Black Swan, whom you see here, uh, an ex a very expensive Australian steed. And she was as famous in Australia as Sarko was in California. But the horse was frail when she arrived in San Francisco that year. I mean, she'd been on a boat for months coming from Australia. So she didn't look that great when she got off the, horse, off the boat. Could this horse stand a chance against Pico's stallion? Sepulveda believed in his mare and he hatched a plan. He made sure that Pico and a crowd were present when Black Swan arrived in LA. Californios tended to favor Spanish breeds uh, and Sepulveda hoped that his mare's kind of frail state, uh, along with the fact that she was Australian, not Spanish, that was gonna fool Pico into thinking a gamble between Black Swan and his horse was an easy win. And that worked. A lot, a lot, a lot of people staked a lot, a lot, a lot of money on Sarko. Uh, and in total, the bets added up to about $50,000 in cash, cattle, uh, and a whole lot of horses, heifers, and sheep. So the two horses met on March 20th in 1852. And Sepulveda had been training Black Swan in secret, and his efforts paid off. So training in secret at night. So the large crowd that gathered in front of the Bella Union uh, was stunned when Black Swan showed up. Uh, stunned because she looked good and she defeated Sarko in 19 minutes and 20 seconds. Finally, a win. He got the win. Uh, but it wasn't just the win that amazed everybody or that freaked everybody out. The jockey who rode Black Stallion to victory was Black. And this never before seen phenomenon, uh, a Black jockey. 
was so noteworthy that reports of the race describes, the firsthand accounts of the race describe how everybody in the crowd gasped when they saw him, but nobody thought to record his name. So his name has been lost to history. All that we know about this man is that he was black. And so what's striking to me about this story is how my recovery, my recovery, my circulation of this story just leads to another erasure. So the more we see, the more we're aware that we're not seeing. So who was this black man? And what must it have meant for him to achieve this great victory under the thumb of a Mexican owner? So a colleague of mine at UCLA, Fred, Doug, Fred Degar, uh, who's a very well-known British Guianese writer, he was so struck by this story when he uh, did the tour that he wrote a poem for this unnamed black jockey. And I, when I read the poem, I was moved in ways that I, I can't fully describe. Um, and I convinced Fred to do a reading of the poem, uh, followed by a conversation between the two of us where we talked about the poem and how the unnamed jockey helps us unpack all of the rage and complexity of our current historical moment. So you can find that uh, conversation on our YouTube channel and I encourage you to, to watch it. So for me, it was really energizing to get to think with another person in a different way about how and why stories are important, how they empower, how they build bridges, foster solidarity and inspire people to create, to, to make new worlds. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do in a nutshell. And I'm making an app, but I, I want to inspire people to create a, a better tomorrow. And I'm closing with this story uh, because it's such a great example of how that can happen. But also because one of the things that Fred and I talk about uh, is what a fantastic movie the story of the unnamed jockey uh, would make. So really, I'm hoping that Nancy uh, can help us create this movie. So stay tuned and follow us on Instagram. And with that, I turn things over to Nancy. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll stop Thank sharing. you so much, uh, Professor Lopez. Fascinating. And you are a whirlwind of so many fantastic things. The app, I can't wait for that. The rides, so uh, badass Latinas all over the place. And we're going to introduce another Latina who has done so much. And she has been a friend of mine for over 20 years and uh, she is our history maker for the evening. Her name is Nancy de los Santos. She is um, a writer, a director, a producer. She's worked on so many things. She started off in Chicago uh, working with Siskel and Ebert who were critics of movies. She's worked on iconic films like Mi Familia and Selena and Resurrection Boulevard, American Family, East Los High. Um, she also had, did a documentary called The Bronze, Bronze Screen, which everybody loves, and it tells the history of Latinos in Hollywood from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, she did that in, I think, the 90s. And um, this year, she began a, a passion project, a Latina romantic comedy, The Answer to My Prayers. Uh, this, she workshopped with Nora Ephron, and Nancy has always created with one objective, to challenge stereotypes and create new perception by writing for projects that reflect a balanced Latino reality. As a result, her work has helped expand Latino viewership on English language networks. Nancy is also an author. She has written a book, an anthology that her and I all both um, were one of the writers for, Eight Ways to Say I Love My Life. She is an amazing person. She, she uh, also does um, charity work. She gives to the homeless uh, in the name of her sister who passed away. She's got the most beautiful heart. And she's an integral part of the groundbreaking group of writers and producers who are helping to change the image of Mexicans on television and film. So we are so happy, Nancy, that you are here as one of our history makers. And we can't wait to hear about all of your secrets, as you say. <laughs> well, thank okay. you so much, Belle. Well, Nancy, uh, uh, what an amazing opportunity we have. We're going to do with, with you, what we have done with so many other amazing Mexican-American history makers like Ambassador Julia Nava and Gloria Molina and so many, you know, uh, people that have done so much for 
our community as you have and would and and as you know our goal is to get to know you nancy we want to know your story we want to know what made you such a success that makes us so proud we want to know what drived you to, to 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 do what you do every day which is change the the, the narrative which is you know you exemplify what what we want to do we want to change the narrative about about our people you know and and this fake narrative and of course we know the story started in chicago we know the story started there and um and i'm you know i mean i will we would love to hear a little bit about your your, your the beginning of your story in chicago how do you end up in chicago i i really didn't know and i guess i know now that there is actually quite a large Mexican American population, but I didn't know that before. So how do you end up in Chicago? It, there is a huge Mexican American uh, population in Chicago. And I think what she's showing right now, what we're looking at right now is me at 16 or 15 or 16 in Chicago. And the way my life started in Chicago, though, goes back to my parents, who are both um, Tejanos, born and raised in Texas, and from big Mexican families. Uh, my father's family, the De Los Santos family, they're both from the same little town of Eastland, Texas. My father had eight brothers that all served in World War II. Eight. Eight brothers, and every single um, arms force ranch that there was. My father himself was in the Navy. And after World War II, they realized that Texas was not going to be as welcoming as they as the state could have. There was still very much no Mexicans, no dogs, no um, no blacks to come into this area. Could you let's save that picture because it looks like it's my wedding, but it's not, <laughs> not at all. So my parents uh, decided, well, both families separately decided to move to Chicago to uh, for work. That's why they went, and that's why a lot of Mexicans went to work. My dad's family were actually migrant workers before the war, so they went from Texas. Like a lot of Mexican families would go to pick whatever the crops were in Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa and in Illinois. And they saw the city and saw that the city had a lot of potential. And my mom's family was the same uh, uh, during World War II. My grandfather, uh, my father's, my mother's father passed away and it was my grandmother, Soledad Gallegos, who said, we have to leave here. We can't survive here as a family. So they all wound up in Chicago. And that's how I became a Chicana from Chicago, as I like to say. <laughs> And the Mexican population there is muy Mexicano, very Mexican. And now I think the second generation, very much Mexican American. But uh, the city, the neighborhoods that have Mexicans, that are Mexican neighborhoods are huge. There's one called Pilsen, another called Little Village, and other that's South uh, Chicago. There's also very large Puerto Rican neighborhoods in Chicago. And I think there was a growing when I was there. I have, haven't lived there for over 20, 25 years now. There was a growing Cuban American, but the Mexican population is most, and very much involved in politics, very much a part of the fabric of the city. That's very, very, very that's amazing information that, may, that I didn't know. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, about a story that you told me, which which is now that is after hearing Professor Lopez talk about you know um, some of the how the, there's been such an intentional effort to erase the the Mexican contribution, and you told me a story which is very powerful. You told me that the one thing that got you interested in 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 the movies and stuff was a comment that your dad made about. You, you and your dad love to watch TV and movies. So remind us about, that's a beautiful story. My father was a amazing human being. Of course, all of our fathers were having to be so brave to leave one city and go to another city and married my mother there in Chicago, six kids. And he was a truck mechanic. So he worked really hard. And at night when he would come home, what he liked to do, what his happy place was the couch, watching television 
And back then there were no remotes. So it had, was a child who had to go and turn the channel or put up the volume or do whatever. And I was that child because I used to love to hang out with my father watching television. There's one particular show that he really enjoyed and that was uh, Dodge City. It had Miss Kitty and the sheriff and other characters. And he really loved watching that show and I watched with him. And one day he just kind of sighed, just like that, you know, just like said, how come there's no Mexicans in Dodge City? And it just clicked. I, I can't even recall what age I was, but I never forgot that conversation because there they were, Dodge City, obviously it's somewhere in the West. Of course there's Mexicans. They should be there in Dodge City. They should have been, Miss Kitty should have been Mexican <laughs> and she wasn't. So uh, that always stayed with me. And I think that was the seed that was planted in my heart that said things have to change. And if we're going to have the a fair and real portrayal of Latinos and of Mexican Americans, and it's gonna take us to write those. And little by little, my mission and my trail led to me writing, even though it was one of these trails, you know, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it always seemed to be like that, right? There's always hard to have a straight path, but, but um, you know, that was a, a, an exciting and, and empowering reason for you to have, uh, to, 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 you know, uh, to be able to make a change. But along the way, something mm -hmm. happened, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, that, that, uh, that for a while, you became a, a gang member. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, I'm exaggerating. You know, uh, 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 you were in a Latino gang. It's a, that's a, a little bit different, I'm sure. Tell us about it. Well, back then it was different, but they were, we, there were gangs in the city and there were a lot of gangs. And the reason people form gangs, as we know now, is to find a companionship, to create a family, to create protection. And for me, it definitely was protection. I was in a high school that was mostly Irish American girls and Italian girls, and they just didn't like us. That's all there was to it. You know, there was a very, there was some racial tension that was there. And the few Mexican, Puerto Rican, and black girls all hung out together. And one of the other Mexican girls who was in my neighborhood was from um, a, a club that was called the Spanish Chantels. And I like to say we were the auxiliary to the Spanish chancellors. And we were a little gang. And what did we do? I mean, we did not go kill people. We did not shoot people. There, that, that didn't exist then. What it really was was you hang out. You uh, maybe we were smoking cigarettes at the time and you know drinking some very low level kind of alcohol. But I would like to say that during that time in my life, and you could show that picture now with the black leather jacket. I feel like I gained. Um, knowledge. And the knowledge that I gained was loyalty, absolutely, to be loyal to whoever your tribe is. Uh, organization. I learned, you know, that there was a, an organization to follow. There's a leader. And then if you are a, one of the people who is working to support that leader, you follow. And we all always would also organize parties. And I learned fundraising because we had to create funds in order to have the parties that often were for people going off to the military, for people who coming out of the hospital or for people who were in an accident. We organized. So we were, we were the good gang girls, not the bad gang girls. And I really oh. appreciate that time that I spent there. Mm -hmm. That's very, very cool. I mean, so no shooting people. No. No, no, no. <laughs> it wasn't a part of that, the scope then. I think after I left, things got worse in Chicago for a long time, and now they have gotten better. Yeah. So um, after, after that adventure, um, what, you know, I know that, that then you, you were in high school, and then you, you, you went to, uh, to, to, to um, secretary school, and I think you mentioned that also maybe like, like hairstylist? Did you say that? No. Okay. I had received a, I, my parents were amazingly dedicated to us getting an education, as many Mexican parents are. So they sacrificed for all of their six school, 
uh, six children to go to Catholic school, which is a good education in Chicago. The nuns really taught and taught well, and I could still remember the lessons. I still know how to structure sentences because of those nuns. And I received a two-year scholarship to go to Catholic girls' school, but that's where they didn't like us there, and I had a hard time with that, and I didn't want to stay. And I think either they asked me to leave or I volunteered. I don't remember which it was, but I had two years left of high school, and my mother said, you know, you're going to public school, and you're going, you know, the, the choices are cosmetology school, which is where they filtered all the Black and Latina girls at the time, or sex and I did choose cosmetology, I did, because oh, okay. all were going there. But my grandmother, my wonderful Abuelita Chulita, who was living with us at the time, uh, she changed my mind. She came one day after working, she worked at a bakery in Chicago, and she said, Nancy, you need to go to secretary school. I see the secretaries, they all wear pretty dresses, and they, they seem to be happy with their job. And she brought me a little a blue typewriter, one of those little royal typewriters, and that sealed the deal for me. And I went to secretary school, where I like to say that I learned how to type, I did not learn how to write. You know, I learned how to type, how to type fast, how to take orders. I learned how to type proposals, but not how to write proposals. So the education was really heavy on the technical part of it and not so much on the creative part of it, which was fine at the time. I, again, there's reasons things happen, but while I was uh, in secretary school, I graduated, I was an excellent secretary. I have a lot of respect for anyone who is a secretary, knowing that we are, and they are the heartbeat of any office. They are the ones that get things done. And um, while I was doing that at a hospital, a young, gentleman there from Colombia, from Colombia in South America, said to me, I do not understand why you are not in college. My family in Colombia sacrificed everything so that I could come to Chicago to go to college. And here you are in Chicago, and you're not in college. Why? And the reason was that the bar for me was graduate high school. And once you do that, you're fine. You're great. We're happy. I was the first in my family, graduate high school. Everybody was happy. And he planted that seed and I took that and uh, started to go to night school and really loved it. I've always loved reading. I've always loved, my, mother, my, my father watched television. My mother was a big reader. So I loved reading, television, it all kind of jammed up together. And that's how I became a writer, I guess, for television and movies. So with that, I went to night school and I got a job in the same place where I was working in the hospital as a nighttime transporter that would take people when they were ill to different places. And unfortunately, if they passed away, I would also have to take them to the morgue. That was kind of, you know, not my favorite job, but <laughs> you what you have to do at the time. They pay the bills. In order to just keep going. And little by little after that, um, it was a community college. I went to a junior college and then met some incredible, always Mexican Americans and, and, and one Puerto Rican professor who encouraged me and said, there's more out there and you need to find it. And it was them who did it. And it was um, Professor um, Betances and Alberto Mata and Gilberto Cardenas who all encouraged me to go to Los Angeles and to do a independent study with uh, the Nor Cal State Northridge Chicano Studies Department. It was just the most incredible experience that really opened up my eyes to uh, the, the business behind it. And uh, myself and there's another student, Jose Gaspar, we did uh, research and interviews with the Latinos, the very few Latinos at the time that were working in television and film mostly television, there really weren't any in film that we knew of. And uh, again, that just one step led to another and I wound up getting my degree in radio, television and film production from the University of Texas at Austin. I wanted to go to Texas. I wanted to have that Tejano experience. How was that? How was the Tejano experience? I love Texas, I really do. I, I feel that it is, first off, I do think it's gonna be blue this year. I'm really hoping. <laughs> 
love the, the grandness of it. It is such, it's a big state physically. It's just big. And there's these um, incredible cities that are there, Houston and Dallas and San mm -hmm. Antonio that I love so much, El Paso and the, the Valley and Corpus Christi, all of them. And they're just, and the, the Latinos that are there, you know, bien Tejanos, yeah, they are Tejanos, but they, mm -hmm. they still, you know, that Tejano Mexicano, you know, it still is, Thing that they say and do and I really my heart I feel like I have Texas in my heart and Chicago wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is so nice now tell us something what a what a great story what a you know and what an encouraging so many of our young audiences I'm sure they're gonna they're, they're they're gonna feel that connection with your with your story and how a lot of times schools unfortunately you know they don't encourage the, our, our young people to to right. They just assume that because we're a minority, because we're Mexican American, that we just need to do, you know, you know, junior college or high school, and that's it. So, such, such a wonderful, such a wonderful example that you are for us. And, but tell us something. How did how did that how did you go from that to all of a sudden to be, you know, a writer, a producer? I mean, you you took. You too, cough. How well, did that happen? I wanna, I, we need to step back just a bit because my first job out of uh, I after my my uh, after I got my degree from the University of Texas, I went to the University of Michigan to get a master's degree, and I really wanted to be Dr. De Los Santos. I thought that sounded really nice, and that would have been nice. But while I was there, um, I went back to Chicago for a summer, and it was there that. Um, I volunteered at the local public tele television station, which I always tell young folks, volunteer wherever you can. You know, just get into the door and let people see you and see who you are. I really wanted the experience. That's, I didn't even know that the show, uh, Roger Ebert and Jean Sisko show existed at that time. I, didn't, I knew of them, but I didn't know of the show. And I was offered the job of assistant producer working with them. And I know that it was affirmative action. I absolutely know that. There were no other Latinos working in that station at the time. I already had my degree in radio, television, and film. I was presentable. I had some experience. I had worked in a, a television station in, uh, in Texas. So I had that experience. And I think working with people like this, that was only because of affirmative action only. I know that. But I got in and I worked hard and I really uh, embraced the show. I embraced these two incredible writers who knew so much about film. Uh, it was one of the best uh, jobs, if I could even call it a job, because we watched movies all day <laughs> and then did a show once a week. It was just great. And that's the, the sort of uh, experiences that spark that that desire in you to really do something and to know that you can do something and also to know that it's not easy to do that people fail at that but many people do succeed and probably you know the 500 movies that I saw while I was working with them what was the percentage of Latinos you know yeah. low, zero exactly movies. and I would <laughs> And we, they would encourage me too and say, yeah, you know, maybe you do need to do something else. Maybe you do need to. And Jean would always say, you know, uh, build on your experiences. That was one of the things that he would uh, encourage me. He said, build on it. If you, if you really want to write, if you really want to write about movies, you're going to have to move. And I hope you don't leave the show, but I wound up leaving. And Roger encouraged me by, uh, by opening up doors and and take and the producer before did not go with them when they would travel to the Cannes Film Festival. I went with them because he knew that I had this desire to learn more about it and whenever they would meet with executives they took me and they really showed who I was and I grew into that position and became their producer and was their producer for about three years and it was a great experience but that opportunity is not going to happen. Remember, that opportunity started. Why? Because I volunteered. Exactly. I, I knocked on the door and said, I would like to have this experience. And I was ready for it. 
I had and a thank you thank you for thank you for clarifying it for us and for our audience and for our young people you know that that there is a, there's an order you you were successful because you 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 study hard and you were prepared and then you were brave and you took an opportunity so yes. listen my friends listen and learn from nancy that's such an amazing story uh and that's how it happens so i know after that then you went on to, to start doing some kind of quite exciting things i mean you you done a number of special uh, you know great great movies and and written great shows and i would like to just maybe that for us to tell us just a little, maybe a little important story or something you remember about some of this great, you know, uh, 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 projects that you work on. For example, like, you know, go to pick, go to pick it up. Tell us a little bit about that. Gotta kick it up was the first writing credit that I received uh, as a writer, and it was the story of a Latina dance team uh, on the. East East Side here in Los Angeles. And it was a Disney movie, and it was the first Disney movie that Disney Channel, I should say Disney Channel movie of the week for television, that centered around Latinas. I think there had been one before that it centered around young men, but this was all women. And this was America Ferraz's first movie, too. It was just a great cast and a great opportunity to write that and the producer wanted a latino writer so again they were looking even back then you know they wanted to have a latino writer and as soon as i got in and said i'm the person to write this i know what these girls are going through i want to tell this story i immediately went out and interviewed those girls and met them and uh wanted that authenticity and i knew that they would tell me the truth and they did they told me how difficult it was and what happened, and then I take that truth, come back and write it. And it was a very successful film for the Disney Channel. And still today, there's young people, young women especially, you know, who remember, gotta kick it up. <laughs> how, how, tell us about Mi fam My Family, Mi Familia. What a beautiful movie. During this whole long process of my life that had all of these twists and turns, um, Roger Ebert was the person who introduced me to Gregory Nava, the director. And Gregory Nava and his, uh, his then wife and writing partner, Anna Th Thomas, were uh, looking for people to help and work with them on films. And it was actually them who said, you need to come to Los Angeles, which you know, nobody was really that. I know that um, Roger was not happy about that. He feels like they stole me away, but I was just ready to go. And I worked with them on a number of movies, including Mi Familia. And with Mi Familia as the associate producer, which is a great title to have because it is what you make it. You know, it's not, you can do the most or you can do the less. I did everything. I love that movie. And I went out and I looked for people in Los Angeles, in East Los Angeles, that's where it was set, to be interviewed by the actual actors. At one point in my home, it was Jimmy Smith's meeting with Latinos who had uh, gone to prison, unfortunately, and had come out, which was his backstory in the movie, and so that he could get that experience. We had that ability to make those connections, and that's what made that movie, I think, so real and so beautiful. Um, and also Gregory is a, a great director, an incredible writer. Anna Thomas is an incredible writer. And it's a great film. And look at who it has in it. Isai Morales, Jimmy Smith, Jennifer Lopez, Edward James Olmos. Everybody was in that movie. And that experience too of all of us working together on a film, you know, to see that. Uh, how many times have you looked at the credits of a movie? And you, you, you can count us. One, two, three. That one. The whole darn credit roll was Latinos. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, we need more of those movies, awesome. definitely. Um, and the same well, happened with we... Nina. The same, we, you know, right after, during Mi Familia, unfortunately, that was when um, we had heard about the horrible murder of Selena. And it, I knew then that both Moctezuma, Esparza, and and uh, Gregory Nava, they really wanted to tell that story. They wanted to be the ones to celebrate her life. And it started right away, you know, making those connections. And I think it was pretty much about a year and a half after her death, you know, that we were in Texas filming that movie. 
And again, my role was as associate producer, wherever and however to help, to, to do whatever possible. And I think the, the, the most, this is a, a, a photograph from where we were shooting um, Jennifer with, to do the different ads, like the Coca-Cola ad that we used in the movie that, that uh, Selena was, when she was the spokesperson. So all of those folks, you know, uh, really hardworking people. And you could see Karina, who was makeup, and Bobby Lemos, who was a UCLA student at the time, worked with us. And of course, the beautiful Miss uh, Jennifer Lopez, standing next to Mark Sanchez, who did her makeup and, you know, did an incredible, wonderful job. And me there with the cap in the middle working. But uh, for Selena, I think that the most wonderful experience that I can remember about Selena, you know, the movie starts out with that great scene of the, the big auditorium, um, the Elm Astrodome in Houston, but we were shooting in, in San Antonio, so it was the Alamo Dome. And myself and the other associate producer, Carolina Caldera, our job was to get the extras to come to there. We needed 30,000 extras free people who would come and stay all day. <laughs> and you think that's, that's a hard order, but we worked really, really hard in getting that done. And, and we worked really, really hard going out, sending flyers. It wasn't computer then. You had to have a flyer and stand on the corner and go to church and school and get it. And that morning, huge, huge rainstorm, thunderstorm in Texas. And I was like, oh my God, we're fired. There's no one's going to show up. And we get there at six o'clock in the morning and there was a line of people around the corner. And I'm not saying that was our work. I'm saying that was the people who loved her so much who showed up. And um, I'm still close with the family. I think that Selena was one of our Mexican-American comets you know, flying through the sky with this amazing energy and talent. And it's really sad when you think about what happened. Very sad, because what it could have been, we'll, we'll never know. But I think we all know it could have been incredibly beautiful, wonderful. As it was, it could have continued to be even more incredibly beautiful, wonderful. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing. Um, tell us, tell us, uh, about your 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 exciting project that you're doing right now. I mean, what what uh, well, what are the things that make you excited these days? You're doing so many great shows, you know. Maybe yeah. tell us about East Lost High. Well, East, I think I think that's that's such a great show. It is. It's on Hulu. I think you can still see it on Hulu. Great experience. Again, it was a writer's room of six Latinas. We still are friends. We still get together with the one male writer, Victor Duenas, who is in the room, and we still get together on Zoom, and we talk, and we just hang out because we all were there working together, making this happen, and that was a good experience, and to actually write about the young people in East Los Angeles in a good way, you know, yes, they had to be having unprotected sex in order for one of them to unfortunately, well, a few of them get pregnant or unfortunately get uh, HIV virus in order for us to tell the story of how not to make that happen, how not to allow that to happen. So that was a great series still on, all the series that are on now, I love them all and I watch them all, I love Vida. I love a pose, you know, I love a hint of five. They're all, it's great that they're there, you know, and people are actually working and telling stories. When I first started, I'm a member of the Writers Guild of America and the, there's a um, Latino Writers Committee, there's a Black Writers Committee, Women's Writer Committee, Native American Writers Committee. When I first started, our meetings would be five people and we were all complaining about not having work. I go to those meetings now, they are 55 people, and of 50 of them are working, and it's really great to see. I see great improvement, much more needs to be done, absolutely, but we are there. We are there and we are working and we are contributing, and I know that uh, with every single writer that I meet, you know, they have that same mission as I do, and that is to elevate our image. And that does not mean everything is positive. That means it's realistic. And right. realistic means that the world is 
all of us. And I appreciate that. I do. Yeah. Yep. Yep. How, Nancy, tell us how do you end up in the in the equinox uh, in in Europe? I know you you um, you were invited to this with the equinox, which is which is comparable to the Sundance, uh, uh, you know, film festival of Europe. Equinox was it uh, was a French government in Europe. The governments actually support the arts with money and it was a French government um, program and my then uh, manager Carolina Caldera de Fante and her husband who was French they knew about this and they submitted a script that I had written called The Answer to My Prayer and it still is my heart I want that ha to happen very badly. I want to see it happen because it's a romantic comedy with Latinas. And I don't think, wow. yet, you know, there's one that I've heard a little bit about um, called, that it's from Christina Nava, that is called In Other Words, but the, the lead is Mexicana, which is great and wonderful. But I mean, really, you know, Mexican Americans, us here, right here. Born That's right talk like me you know that they're english and spanish and bicultural and all those things so i had written this story about uh latinas in chicago it was set in chicago and we sent it in but the funny thing is i can say this now i couldn't say this a while back is that you were supposed to be european <laughs> in order to be a part of the program so we didn't know that and they just assumed that i was from spain <laughs> <laughs> so I show up at the reception in Bordeaux, France, so excited that I was chosen, and they're speaking to me in Castellano, which is very difficult for me to <laughs> Being a Chicano from Chicago, and uh, I just knew that there's times when you should speak up, and there's times when you should say nothing and just stay on the road. And that's what I did. And that's where I met the wonderful Delia uh, Efron, who shepherded my script and told me some great ideas on how to make it a true romantic comedy, which I did. More recently, I have taken it out of Chicago and put it into San Antonio. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one, because I love the city. But number two, the prayer that is used in the, in the movie is a prayer to San Antonio. And very simply, it was my abuelita Chulita, my grandmother, who gave me the prayer when I was 30 years old. As you know, San Antonio is the saint that you pray to when you lose something, like San Antonio helped me find my car keys. And my grandmother said that um, I wasn't married at the time, and she said, your husband is lost, and San Antonio will help you find him. <laughs> it only took like another 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, did it work? <laughs> A long time but yes i did marry a wonderful wonderful human being a wonderful man dan reza good guy from here no. you know from east l.a and his family now lives in whittier great people great mexican-american family and wow what what a wonderful what a wonderful story i want to see that movie i just, just hope that it gets the it, it hopes to happen soon yeah. what else are you working on right now well, at the moment, right now, I'm also working with Maria Elena Rodriguez, uh, another writer uh, from the Writers Guild, and we are, uh, we have the rights to, and we're developing a half hour television show based on the Homegirl Cafe, which is the restaurant that is under the umbrella of Homeboy Industries. Mm -hmm. And Homegirl Cafe is in Chinatown. Unfortunately, I, I think they're mostly closed now. They might have takeout, like every place else. But it is just such a great organization, and especially this particular restaurant that was founded by a chef named uh, Bati Zarate. And what they do is that they, Bati, they, the homeboy industries was always for the males coming out of prison to go and, and get some training to get a job. As Father Greg oh, wow. has said, nothing stops a bullet like a job. So he trains them, they get a job, they feel self-respect, they get rid of some of their tattoos and they become members of society. <laughs> wow. So for the women, they did this way where they would learn how to be in the service industry, the food industry, chefs, cooks, waitresses, and it's just an incredible 
organization and a place of redemption mm -hmm. you know, were women like me who had this either gang, drug, or whatever affiliation as a younger person have an opportunity to turn their lives around. And it's dramatic, it's funny, and it has some really great food in it. So we've been out selling that, and um, you know, I think we have a good chance. I really think we have a good chance. We just have to see in this new world right now how to make that happen, but we're definitely working hard at it. Wow, wow. Well, you, you have an amazing story, and you've been able to tell so many great stories and and i know that we're going to be seeing a lot more coming in the in the near future and and we thank you for 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 changing the narrative you know for for telling the stories that tell who we really are you know the positive the the, the creative the the the, the uh, hard working you know mexican american people that we really are and um, we're very proud of you we're very, very proud of you. I would look, could you tell us, you know, what are, what, what are the, the advice if, that you would give, now with all this experience, what would be the advice that you would give first to, to the, the, a 12-year-old Nancy de los Santos? Okay, 12-year-old. How, how do you become this successful person? Exactly what I'm gonna tell her. I would tell her, number one, know your history know where you are from, know your family's history. Do not go out in the world not knowing how the heck you got to where you are. I don't even know everything about my grandparents, but I know how brave they were. And I know that if they were brave, I can be brave. Know where you wanna go. I think that was one of the reasons why the bronze screen, the documentary, 100 years of the Latino's contribution to Hollywood cinema was so important to me and my co-producers, Alberto Dominguez and Susan Racho. We wanted to document that history. Too often, I meet people who are in this business who think that they're the first ones. No, no, no. We have been working in the movies since day one, and television, and especially in the movies. Day one, 100 years of a great history that people should know. Um, Marisa, history is super important. I think that's where we get our strength. That's where you get your foundation. I, I feel like the first time I was able to go to Mexico City and go to the uh, Clan, right? Or is it Teotihuacan? Yeah. Teotihuacan. And go there and see those pyramids and stand on those pyramids. And I was able to say, wow, this is a part of me. I am wonderful. Our people are great. We discovered zero. We created these amazing cities. Exactly. We are so much more than we know. So know your history, number one. Everything else will fall in place. Wow. What an amazing, what are, that, that is a, a beautiful way to end this, this conversation. I mean, we, we, uh, we're very, very proud of you. We're very thankful that you, we know this, how busy you are. We know all these projects that you're working on and, 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 and they keep you super busy. And we really thank you for, for, for your kindness to spend a little bit of time with us and share your story. And let us, you know, I can tell you that the lots and lots of people are, are watching and they will be watching this and they will be inspired by you. And, and they will want to tell stories and, and change the narrative and, and, uh, and, and, you know, make a better future for all of us. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, I'm sure that Belle might want to, you know, yes. say words because I know you guys are friends. You both have been working hard and I, we might even have some questions from the audience. Oh, definitely. Well, definitely a lot of good wishes. Um, you're amazing. Thank you for sharing your journey. And uh, also, you know, from Jerry Velasco, he wants to say congratulations, Nancy, um, because people will learn from your life experiences. And um, he was also asking what you would recommend so that you answered that question. Um, Victor Duenas, who was part of your writer's room for Islos High, he, he was inspired by you. And then Adela Garcia said, thank you, Nancy. Um, affirmative action opened a lot of doors for so many. And it's okay to say it opened it for me. And so th that she thanks you for, for doing that. 
open the door, but you won't stay in unless you are really committed and you do the work. You'll get in the door, but you have to do the work. Yes, yes. Uh, so you are a blessing. Uh, not a lot of questions, a lot of accolades. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, I mean, you have such a, a, a wonderful life of, of struggle, of really trying to get Latinos the visibility and the, the roles. And, you know, as, as simple as that sound, it is so hard. And you are one of the, the writers that has succeeded in that. And um, therefore, we see some of the, 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 the characters that other non-Latinos can't write because they don't know. They can't write it authentically. So, yep. You do this too, but wherever I have been, wherever you have been, we always open the door for others. We always say, hey, I heard there's this job here, or I know you can do this. You need to call this person and come and do it. That's yeah, if there's build that network. Yeah, if there's one thing that I know of Nancy, she's always helping. She's always trying to connect people. That's what we should all be doing is what she's saying. And I totally agree. This has been a fascinating evening. Uh, it was wonderful to hear from Dr. Lopez and you. And man, Latinas, we're chingonas. I just, what else can I say? <laughs> Um, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And now um, let's turn it over back to you, uh, Dr. Reese, um, so we could say goodbye uh, and thank all of our viewers, which there was well, many. Yeah, well, what a what a special event, full of powerful women. It, it, that's that's something that I've learned very early in my life. My mom, a powerful Mexican American woman, and 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 I'm, I've always been proud of of of. Uh, of our Mexican American women, how smart and powerful they are. Um, I, I, you know, I want to thank La Plaza again for, for uh, you know, being our partners in this events. Next month we have uh, Armando Duron, uh, a judge, somebody who who started the the uh, the National Hispanic Media Coalition uh, uh, together with Alex Nogales. He's done a tremendous amount. I mean, he's a Chicano, and he's done a lot. And we're going to learn about next, next month, we're going to learn about the Chicano movement. We're going to learn about the Chicano art because we need to know. We need to know history, as Dr. Lopez reminds us. History is very important, as Nancy reminds us. And as we keep trying to do here at the Mexican-American Cultural Education Foundation, yeah, remind us of the past because we can't forget. We cannot allow the past to repeat itself, but also remind us of what a beautiful uh, a culture we have and what an illustrious history we have that we need to be proud of and we need to tell more of the stories. So, Abelardo, uh, I know that, that, um, that we, we, uh, we always want to say some closing words, so maybe I will pass it to you, my friend, uh, from La Plaza. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruiz. Thank you so much for the, those inspirational stories, Nancy. That was great. Uh, Dr. Lopez, Marisa, thank you very much for the, all the work that you're doing with Picturing Mexican America and all the work that you're going to be doing coming up. And Belle, of course, a great host, a great MC. And Micaela Ruiz, I believe that's your sister behind the scenes. Is that correct, Dr. Dr. Ruiz? That's my daughter. That's your daughter. Ooh, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much uh, for lending her, lending her to us for, for the evening. Uh, uh, as Bell said, there are lots of questions, lots of uh, comments. We can't get to them all. Uh, we have people tuning in from San Antonio. Eileen Kret listening from San Antonio. All of you have done an amazing job. Bravo. Laura Salinas. I love seeing all these photos from your life and from your familia Selena. The Selena photo really took me down memory lane. Oh, Thank you for wow. giving me that fabulous opportunity. You're such a champion of our community. Thank you. And that seems to be the theme that you have been uh, just a, 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 a pioneer in the space of, uh, of filmmaking as a Latina, as a Chicana, and that you've inspired others. And as Bell said, you've opened the doors, as both of you have opened the doors for many, many others. I thank you so much. And Bell, you know, Bell and I together, we, we've done so much together. and. So much for Bell. I mean, I I woke up this morning thinking we have to have a Bell Hernandez Appreciation Day. You know, because you know, you know the story I wanted to say is that I was Nancy asked me if I could help 
with the casting of Selena, we had open call for the young, the little young Selena and the older Selena. And we had it at Union Station with miles and miles of young women standing to try out for Selena. So that's one of the memories that I have of working with, one of the many memories I have of working with Nancy. Thanks, Nancy, for being who you are and always reaching back. It's our, our community is beautiful and wonderful. I, I always have said I'm so happy that I'm Mexican American. <laughs> I love being Chicana, it's wonderful, and we just have a wonderful world, and I want to share it with everybody in a good way. And that's, yeah. what, and that's what you're doing too, Dr. Ruiz and uh, the birth of, and Marisa, you know, history is super important. Uh, please check out Marisa Chicana por mi raza, which is another great photo Chicana um, internet place to go to for great Chicana history. Well, thank you so much. If you are on Zoom, if you did not catch this, uh, or Facebook Live, if you did not catch all the, the session, we will be posting this on our YouTube page at La Plaza LA and also on our Facebook page at La Plaza now. LA. As you see, this is a little jerry rig. We couldn't quite get the stream onto Facebook, so iPhone comes in handy to get the broadcast, and we make it happen no matter how. Uh, you can also check our, our La Plaza YouTube page and see an interview that we did with, with Marisa talking about all her ver projects. So go to our, our site. We have it all archived. Also, a conversation that Bell had, Dan Guerrero's happy hour. <laughs> you can check that out as well. And also uh, the Mexican-American Cultural Educational Foundation's two other sessions that we've had at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes are in Casa session with Gloria Molina and with Ana Valdez. And this one, of course, will be on there. We talked, Val, you started off by talking about the Chicano Moratorium, a very, uh, uh, gr I mean, just an impactful day for our community. On En Casa con La Plaza this Friday, we have songs of the Chicano Rev uh, Moratorium with Agustin Gursa, writer and editor, who's currently working uh, with the UCLA Stratwood Frontera Collection of Mexican American recordings. He'll be exploring the protest music of the summer of 1970. Okay. And then on Saturday, we have Inside the Chicano Moratorium, 50 years later with Rosalio Munoz. He was a student body president at UCLA and one of the co-organizers of the Chicano Moratorium. He'll be with us at three o'clock on Saturday. And then next Wednesday, it's September 2nd, the Chicano Moratorium aftermath with four community forces, people that went to the, that participated in the moratorium and that became active in their communities later. Willie Erron, Chuy Velo, Margarita Cuaron, and Maria Elena Yepes. Mm -hmm. You'll be hearing some great stories and some great voices. So please tune in to En Casa Con La Plaza, sponsored by SoCal Gas and the California Humanities. Again, if you did not catch the whole session, catch it on Facebook, catch it on YouTube. We'll see you next month, Dr. Lu uh, Jose Luis Ruiz, and we'll see everybody, all our attendees that made it tonight. Thank you so much. A final goodbye from everybody, please, while I'm going to go ahead and do a gallery here and a screenshot. <laughs> good night to everyone. Good night. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Buenas noches. Buenas noches a todos. <laughs>